The Obama administration continues to push for another new free trade agreement based on the NAFTA model called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Involving 12 Pacific Rim nations, the TPP will cover over 40% of the world's economy. Even so, it's being negotiated with an unprecedented level of secrecy. And the administration is also moving forward with negotiations of a transatlantic agreement as well. So on December 7th here in Portland, the Alliance for Democracy and the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign organized a public forum to continue developing the opposition to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Joseph Santos Lyons, I'm a community minister here at the First Unitarian Church of Portland. I welcome all of you. And I'm also the executive director of APANO, which is the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon. And I wanted to start, so, you, so we're here today for a community forum on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I wanted to start actually by sharing a children's story. Uh, I bought this at Powell's last month for my kids. It's from an artist and writer named Nikki McClure. And I just want to read a few pages to sort of start off today's forum. It's called To Market, To Market. Today is market day. The farmers load their trucks with carrots and squashes, pears and mushrooms, fennel and chard. We find our basket and make a list of the food we need. The bakers warm their hands as they unload cookies and cakes, breads and scones. We put on our coats and scarves, then walk and run and race down the hill. Today is market day. We hear the bell ringing. Everyone is gathering. The whole town is here. The whole town is here. So one of the reasons why I'm here today is because of market day, because of what it symbolizes for so many communities around the world. People growing foods in the local economy, people coming together and buying and selling in the local economy, kids and families being able to purchase things that they are familiar with in their region, in their province, in their state, and the love and the joy that comes from being in that place and how communities that have that often have a lot more stability and safety and livelihood and well-being and prosperity. And so today, probably like you, we're here to learn about the Trans-Pacific Partnership this is something that I actually don't know a lot about, but I have the honor of helping to uh, moderate the conversation today and to hear from a group of wonderful experts here. So we're really pleased to be able to bring this forum to you today, uh, sponsored by a number of important groups led by the Oregon Fair Trade Coalition. And I wanted to share a few things about the Trans-Pacific Partnership to sort of set the framework. So many folks may be uh, familiar with trade agreements like NAFTA, which was something that I became aware of when I was a young adult, that really have exacerbated poverty and displaced workers and have really driven multinational corporate profit. These policies have really been a disaster. We've seen job loss. We've seen forced migration. Folks may be familiar with some of the immigration debate that's affecting America right now, and a lot of that is driven by NAFTA from a generation ago. We've seen small farms wiped out, medicine prices raising, and attacks on national environmental policies around the world that undermine the democratic structures. So Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, that's an acronym you'll likely hear quite a bit today, is a massive new free trade agreement that just finished a round of negotiations last week. The US is, of course, one of the leading drivers, uh, but there's a, about 12 organizations, a number of whom are in Asia. And they represent about 40% of the global economy. This is already bigger than NAFTA, uh, but perhaps even more significant, because it's intended to be a docking agreement, which means that other countries will be pressured to join it over time, including the Philippines, whose government has already expressed interest in joining the negotiations. So there's a lot more details about the partnership, and you're going to hear from our experts about it. But I wanted to set 
the final sort of cornerstone of the conversation by talking about what is happening in the Philippines briefly. Folks may have heard about the super typhoon. Yes? And the devastation that happened in the Philippines. And many of you uh, and myself have relationships with the Philippines. My partner is actually from the Philippines. And while our family was not affected directly by the typhoon, um, our family there and the country has definitely been deeply impacted with many lives lost and a real change in the local economy. And there are so many things that connect together, how our economic policies, how trade, how the ability to be sustainable really drive not only the economic aspects of our lives, but the impact on global warming and climate change and the environment. And as we see over the last several years, especially, really severe weather events, you can't help but think that these things are all connected. So I wanted just to share this quote that one of the speakers uh, passed around while we were preparing from one of the Filipino uh, commissioners who's been a part of the talks on global warming. So she says, you cannot blame us for being impatient. We cannot go on negotiating every year without concrete action to avoid further warming. We know now that warming fuels super typhoons and that in all probability is going to be the norm. We are forced to brace for these changes even if it's not our fault. You see, if the developed countries had, have shown the leadership to reduce greenhouse gases, developed countries like us, like me, Americans, at the onset of this convention, we the most vulnerable would not have to adapt. We would not have to ask or push for adaptation support around the world. So with these words and with this context, um, I'm very pleased to introduce our five speakers for today. And I'm going to, I think the format for today is we're gonna give them each a chance to say a few words, uh, speak for a few minutes each. And so we'll be getting a chance to hear a lot of wisdom and ideas and strategies. Um, and then at the end, we'll have some time for questions. So if you do have a question, if you would hold it to the end, and then those, I think there's gonna be a mic maybe set up at some point, or we'll bring a mic down. Um, and then after that, we had planned to have some time for small groups, so folks could connect directly with some of the speakers to talk more about some of the direct issues um, around Trans-Pacific Partnership and how to stop it. Sound good? good? All right, thank you. Got my amen choir right here. So um, first we have David Delk. Uh, he knows firsthand the effects of the wealth divide. As a kid, David struggled out of poverty and also began to question the myth of the American dream that it was all getting better. His mission is centered in democracy and ending corporate power over our lives. He represents the Alliance for Democracy where he serves as our local Portland co-president and national co-chair. David will talk about how the TPP would threaten democracy by undermining local laws and regulations. To his right and your left is Mike Lozier. And Mike is a researcher, organizer, and an artist with Portland Rising Tide, a grassroots climate justice organization. He works with local tribes, communities in Eastern Oregon, and activists across the Pacific Northwest to stop the development and transportation of new fossil fuels. Mike will speak about how the TPP will drive fossil fuel imports and impact on climate change. Next to Mike is Valerie Francisco Menchavez, so Valerie is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Portland. We're glad to have you in Oregon. Welcome. Dr. Francisco's scholarship is inspired by and invested in the leadership and activism of Filipino migrants. She recently worked with Filipino caregivers in, in, the, um, in uh, Northern California and researched the impact of Filipino immigration, transnational families, domestic work and gender, specifically with regard to low wage migrant workers. Dr. Francisco will speak about how the TPP furthers economic imperialism and climate change, made very real and personal for us all by the super typhoon that devastated the Philippines. Greg Paulson is a journeyman electrician with 35 years in the wood products industry. He's currently vice president and political director of the Association of Western Pulp and Paper Workers Union, representing workers in Virginia, Utah, California, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. Greg will speak to the impact of TPP on our local economy and job loss. 
And lastly, Elizabeth, is it Swagger? Swagger. Swagger. Elizabeth Swagger uh, is helping to lead a successful organizing, she helped lead a successful organizing drive at Free Greek, the unionized there several years back and directed Sweat Free Northwest before becoming executive director of the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. The campaign is a statewide coalition of labor, environmental, and human rights organizations that work together to stop the expansion of NAFTA-style free trade agreements. This so-called free trade has a legacy of hurting workers in the environment and Elizabeth drives and her organization a new positive vision for international trade. And she will give us an update on where the fast track negotiations are around TPP today. So will you please all join me in welcoming our five speakers. So as uh, Joseph said, my name is David Delk and I'm the president of the Portland chapter of the Alliance for Democracy. Uh, the mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to uh, end corporate domination and to establish true democracy. So I'm going to focus my comments today on the undemocratic nature and the effects of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and this whole web of global governance uh, which has been created by the free trade agreements that have been created up to this time. So first, the very process of negotiating this particular agreement has been very undemocratic. One hallmark of democratic governance is transparency, yet with the TPP, the level of, of secrecy has been unprecedented. Um, with the TPP, negotiators have been sworn to secrecy. Congress people who have seen the text have been sworn to secrecy. Even during the Bush years, the government actually released negotiating text on government websites for interested parties to see and to discuss. Uh, and under Bush, Congress was actually involved with the negotiations, but not with the TP. Even our U.S. representatives and senators have been denied access to the text, and when they have been allowed to see it, they're not permitted to take cameras, paper, pens into the room uh, where they read the text or to take notes. And of course, they are all sworn to secrecy, so even though they might be able to look at it, they can't talk about it. Um, so in spite of the fact that we have all been excluded, 600 corporate lobbyists have been granted special status to see, read, comment on, and many times to actually write the text of the agreement. Uh, so just on that level, the TPP process has been extremely undemocratic. But we, we do have an idea what the effects of the TP uh, will be because some text has been, been leaked, including chapters uh, involved with, the, with investments and intellectual property rights. And WikiLeaks just uh, released uh, the full text of the property rights chapter uh, just a couple weeks ago so we can see you know, what, the, what the United States has proposed and what our trading partners uh, you know, how they have reacted. They haven't reacted uh, very positively to the American proposals. But not only is the negotiating process undemocratic, the agreement itself is an attack on democracy. All governments answer the question, who gets to decide? Prior to the American Revolution, the answer was the king. The king was the decider. The Trans-Pacific Partnership and most of the agreements which have come before have answered that question the multinational corporations will decide. We the people have fought multiple movements to increase the number of people who are involved or who are included in the phrase, we the people. We have engaged in mass struggle to expand the definition of citizen to, to include former slaves, those who do, did not own property, women, labor, uh, KG, uh, I should get this one right. <laughs> Uh, LGBTQ people and more, uh, those struggles continue today and of course they are going to continue on into the future. Well, the wealthy elites have also fought for democratic rights, democratic rights for property and for corporations. With the enactment of the, Oregon, with the, enactment of the American Constitution, with its interstate commerce clause, they set up the world's first free trade area ensuring that local and state uh, laws could not interfere with cross-state state commerce. Uh, 
Corporations have been given our constitutional rights through the U.S. court system. For instance, the Southern Pacific Railroad versus Santa Clara County decision in 1886 declared that corporations had 14th Amendment rights to equal protection and due process under law. More recently, the U.S. Supreme Court declared that because corporations are people, that limitations on corporate funding of elections were an infringement on the corporation's free speech rights and were not allowed. But corporations have not stopped just at attempting to get human rights nationally. Internationally, they have induced our elected officials in Washington, D.C. and the capitals of our, of our trading partners to enact these so-called free trade agreements. These agreements have formed a spider's web of corporate decision making which covers the globe, ensuring that multinational corporate interests uh, desire to make profits cannot be challenged by local, state, or national governments. If a multinational corporation perceives that their future profit-making ability has been harmed by a local, state, or national change in law or regulation, they can bring an investment state protection suit against a national government for either compensation or to overturn the law. These agreements enacted one at a time have in fact been a corporate coup against the democratic decision making of we the people. NAFTA was the first agreement which included an investor protection, uh, investor state protection clause. Uh, almost all agreements since then have, in have included this. These suits bypass national courts and are filed in one of two international private courts designed specifically to hear these cases. The most often used is actually run by the World Bank. Unlike American courts, the court process, or I, I should say unlike most American courts, uh, the court process is secret. The tribunal judges can only rule on the basis of trade rules with no consideration of other factors. The judges are quite often corporate lawyers or lobbyists. In fact, it's not unusual for a representative, uh, for a representative of a suing corporation to be judged in the next case. One of the first investor state cases involved a Canadian supplier of a key chemical in the MTBE gasoline additive. MTBE is a possible human carcinogen, and when added to water, gives water a turpentine smell. So when MTBE started leaking into California's waters, the state banned its use. While the Canadian supplier was not the manufacturer, it still sued, claiming that its profit-making its profit abilities had been harmed. This Canadian multinational corporation sued the United States federal government because of the action of a state. An American company could not have brought such a suit against the U.S. government. Under investor to state protection clauses, only a foreign multinational corporation is allowed to bring such a suit. California was not even allowed to be present in the courtroom to defend its acts, but instead had to depend on the U.S. government to defend its interests. And we all know quite frequently that state interests are quite different than federal uh, interests. Recently, WikiLeaks released the intellectual property rights chapter uh, text of the Trans-Pacific Partnerships. There's a lot of reason to be concerned about, what, about what's in that uh, chapter, but I want to focus just on one, which is its effects on uh, affordable medicine. I've been HIV positive since 1985. I've been on HIV meds since 1990. Those meds today cost in the area of $31,000 a year. Uh, luckily, I have good insurance, uh, so it's affordable. But for people in low and middle income uh, nations, these are extremely high prices, and they can be a death sentence for people. But what saves them? Well, India saves them. India manufactures and distributes uh, generic HIV meds, price less than $100 annually. More than 100 million people have been able to take care of their HIV uh, AIDS uh, infections because of generic uh, drugs. The TPP release text shows a concerted attack on generic drug production in order to ensure the profits of big American, American multinational pharmaceutical uh, corporations.
uh, patent terms would be extended from 20 to 25 years at least, and greenwashing would be allowed. Greenwashing is the reformulation of existing medicines by, for instance, changing a pill into a liquid gel cap and then relicensing the, pa the patent or renewing it. Uh, and of course, thereby uh, preventing competition uh, by generics. The WTO has allowed the manufacture of generics even while the patent is in effect for nations where the high cost would result in severe hardship. The TPP would prohibit that manufacture. The TP also sets up barriers to sharing of drug, of drug data. The original manufacturers must prove drug safety. By international agreement, manufacturers of generic may use that original data to prove their safety, but the TPP would prevent drug data sharing, causing each generic manufacturer to go through years of expensive testing before manufacturing could start. And the TP also extends patents over surgical techniques, medical tests, and treatments which have not been patented up until this time. So we need to realize that these free trade agreements represent a corporate coup against democracy itself, and we need to defeat them. We need to defeat the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and we need to turn our sights on those agreements which are already in effect and say no. No to corporate trade agreements, no to the corporate coup. So as mentioned, I'm Mike Lozier. I'm an organizer with Portland Rising Tide. Um, very briefly, Portland Rising Tide is an all-volunteer organization uh, that's committed uh, to climate justice and confronting the root causes of climate change um, through an anti-oppression framework. Um, so very briefly, climate justice um, is acknowledging the fact that uh, you know, those least responsible for causing climate change historically are the ones that are going to be left with the burden. Um, and so when we confront climate change, we have to make sure that our work, too, is not shifting to that burden, uh, that burden to those that are least responsible, um, and that the transition that we do make is just. Um, and so the quote that um, was shared earlier, uh, I think, has particular res residence, uh, resonance um, in kind of the state of the climate right now, um, and particularly the comments of, can't blame us for being impatient. Um, Right now, our climate um, has a, is at 400 parts per million uh, in greenhouse gases. Um, and we are, in conservative um, estimates, um, see us on a track to four to six degrees Celsius change um, in prevailing uh, temperatures by the end of this century. Um, and this far exceeds the kind of international consensus on um, uh, getting us at a two degree Celsius change at a minimum, which even at itself is ridiculous because a two degree Celsius change is basically a consensus on genocide in Global South, when we already know that one degree Celsius change pretty much um, you know, dooms a lot of um, peoples in the, in the Global South as well. And we're already seeing those effects play out too. Um, and so it's important when we kind of look at the systemic issues in addressing things systemically, that we look at um, you know, the, the roles of capitalism as it plays into um, causing climate change. Um, particularly when we see the imperatives of capitalism being the production and accumulation of capital um, as being kind of a large agitator for the extraction and production of the greenhouse gases that get um, pushed into our atmosphere. And free trade agreements are basically, they're illegal technology. Um, that serves to mobilize society towards the velocity and speed of capital and its accumulation. Um, and of course, this is very much the um, situation with the TPP. Um, and for this mobilization of society to take place for the movement of capital, um, this means a deepening of political dispossession as well. Um, the reduction of all barriers um, for this movement. Um, so it's important to kind of look at Pacific Northwest right now and the movement of fossil fuels. Um, right now, uh, there is a proposal um, between um, Southern Oregon and, um, and British Columbia 
There is five new coal terminal proposals and two expansions of existing ones, uh, which amount to 128 million tons of coal being pushed through this region. Uh, proposals for three new oil pipelines uh, that would amount to 1.5 million barrels a day, and a proposal for six new liquefied natural gas pipelines, which would result in 11.2 billion cubic feet a day. Um, this um, pretty much amounts to seven, ti seven times the amount of uh, the, the loadout that the Keystone Pipeline would be pushing through. Um, and this is not accounting for the recent proposal at the Port of Vancouver, uh, which is an oil by rail project that is seeking to move 360,000 barrels a day. Um, and the thing is, is that this is a huge regional push, um, and largely it's to export to Asian markets, which, which the TPP would facilitate. Um, and a lot of these um, proposals are really hard to keep track of. So the ones that I mentioned, too, are not all the ones that are on the table. There's probably some that I have missed. Um, and that, uh, you know, some ports are catching on to kind of like the resistance <laughs> to this, too, where they are updating the infrastructure at the ports without the presence of any kind of proposal, anticipating that eventually that there will be a fossil fuel export proposal kind of landing there. Um, and so these things kind of take place invisibly, too, uh, much like kind of these closed-door agreements with the TPP. Um, and so how does the TPP facilitate this? Um, one is through a tribunal system uh, in which individual corporations have the power to challenge environmental law, regulations, and court decisions that negatively impact uh, the expectations of profits, or what they call regulatory taking. Um, this is actually not new. Um, in a, in a nuance, it is, um, but you know, right now there's discussion with the fact that um, some of the moves that are being made to challenge these uh, proposals through the um, permitting process, um, or even just um, the use of the Clean Air Act, um, the Endangered Species Act, or Unmarine Mam Mammal and Protection Act, um, these protections have already been you know, rolled back a bit by the uh, WTO. Um, and around the kind of permitting, uh, the delays around projects uh, with LNG and coal, the permitting process and the delays associated with that, um, there's been discussion that this is a violation of the WTO treaty as well. Um, and so what we see is an um, environment that's being created that privileges uh, less protections and a race to the bottom uh, to move these, uh, these fossil fuels through our region. Um, and so in challenging this too, um, what we've seen kind of recently in confronting these fossil fuel projects um, uh, is attempts in utilizing the regulatory structure to kind of slow things down. Um, some people uh, refer to this as paper wrenching, uh, so to speak. Um, and, um, but increasingly though, as we see kind of with the TPP, uh, we see the conflation of the interests of capital with the public interest. Um, there is a uh, U.S. Natural Gas Act that requires environmental and economic review before moving projects on uh, fracking, um, which uh, some people have successfully used um, to kind of you know, slow things down going through the environmental review, making sure that people are engaged in a process to determine whether these projects happen or not. Um, but if these uh, projects are uh, expected to be used for exports, um, and it's part of a, and if it's a free trade agreement country, these protections are basically canceled uh, because it's assumed to be at the public interest. Um, and so one thing we have to keep in mind is when we engage the regulatory structure and the protections that we have, that this is an evolving legal landscape um, that increasingly reflects the interests of capital. The more the regulatory structure and protections succeed in preventing harmful and unjust, unjust projects, the more corporations learn how to undermine it. And they have done that. They pressure you know, politicians who then pressure um, you know, the EPA and other state um, protection agencies, threatening cuts to budgets and stuff to make changes um, uh, and creating barriers for people to kind of engage that process. Um, and the TPP and, um, and the free trade agreements are kind of like a perfect uh, representation of this too and how they've kind of evolved. And you know, they couldn't get everything like you know, with the WTO, and so you know, now they're kind of going with this other strategy um, with these docking agreements um, in the uh, TPP. And so when we engage the regulatory structure, we have to make sure that um, it's not becoming a means to manage opposition. And so it's important that, you know, while at kind of like the legal level, there's this push to mobilize society through um, 
legal structure um, and this kind of deepening of what kind of, de or this determination rather of uh, what kind of relationships we have with each other, with our labor and our environment, um, that we mobilize resistance in the opposite direction, that it instead asserts um, the fact that we get to decide and the kind of relationships that we want with our environment. Um, and this is you know, expressed in acts of civil disobedience and direct action, um, which is um, growing um, in the Pacific Northwest in response to these projects. Um, and so it's important that, uh, that we not only defy laws that we feel that are unjust, but also in certain act relationships that we feel are just. Because to make a just transition, we also have to make sure that we are kind of creating these relationships um, that we feel are um, you know, more in our interests. Um, and direct action has had success in previous um, uh, uh, trade in disrupting trade agreements uh, before 1998 with the multilateral agreement on investments, 1999, the millennial round in Seattle with the WTO, uh, 2003, free trade area um, of the Americas in Miami. Uh, in 2013, there was protests in Vancouver, BC over the TPP. Uh, and there's been active resistance in, in indigenous territories as well. Um, there's an active blockade in Wet'suwet'en uh, territories in British Columbia uh, to a pipeline project. Um, it's called the Mini Stoughton Camp there um, that has um, been resisting the Pacific Trail Pipeline, which Chevron is 50% owner of and is also a key uh, stakeholder in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, and the Elsa Pogtog in New Brunswick has been um, resisting fracking by this company uh, called SWN Resources. Um, and just yesterday, um, the SWN, after um, much violence visited upon them, um, and but very strong uh, direct action and resistance, uh, SWN has withdrew from their land um, and is withholding all projects until 2015, at least, so minor victories there. Um, and right now, Portland Rising Tide is uh, supporting uh, the tribes of the Umatilla and um, Warm Springs, uh, tribes and resisting the shipments of uh, tar sands equipment through East Oregon uh, right now, uh, which uh, was success successfully blocked by the Nez Perce in Idaho recently. Uh, they were able to also get a court injunction to prevent that. Um, so it looks like my time's up, but uh, yeah. Um, so it's important uh, in summary, um, in resisting the TPP um, and to kind of adequately address climate change that we're also creating the relationships and the systemic change that we want to see uh, on the land and very directly. Magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Um, good afternoon um, to everyone here. I want to first thank um, the organizers of this event and thank the um, David and um, Mike for their comments. Um, for teaching us a little bit and setting the groundwork. I want to um, continue with what Reverend Santos Lyons was talking about. On November 8th, um, the sort of largest and strongest super typhoon um, internationally called Haiyan or Yolanda hit the, the central Philippines. An island called Samar was where landfall hit, where 195 mile, miles per hour winds sort of, de uh, I mean, not sort of, really devastated um, the, the, the lives and livelihood of um, Filipinos in the central region of the country. Um, growing up in the Philippines, I understand that the, ty that the Philippines is a typhoon-prone country. Um, the, it, it's, it's definitely in that part of the world. However, um, the devastation that was really um, destroying, you know, you probably saw the images, uh, by a show of hands, uh, how many folks saw images of the, dis the destruction? Absolutely. Um, it displaced tens and thousands of people. Um, the death toll continues to rise. Um, there is definitely sitios and barangays, um, villages and towns that um, are not able to continue their, the sort of um, process of living, right? Um, there's a, a lot of internal migration happening in the Philippines. Um, people in central Philippines going to the nearest um, cities and then even to Manila. And I think, for me, when um, 
th those, the weeks where uh, our TVs and our newspapers were flooded with those images of just destruction, it reminded me of Hurricane Katrina, it reminded me of Haiti, it reminded me of um, the ways in which disaster is hard. It, it was heavy for me and I'm sure for a lot of other folks. And the question that came up for me was how much of this natural disaster was natural, right? And how much of it was man-made? Um, and this is where I wanna sort of go today um, to bring sort of the, the victims of the, the typhoon um, here in the room with us and also bring the sort of resistance um, happening currently um, around responding to this. I mean, we're talking about the free trade agreements um, in Bali just in, in the past couple of days, um, the WTO met and the People's Global Camp, a counteraction to, the, to these discussions. We're also conversing with people's organizations and acting people to people solidarity to talk about the urgent needs of people and communities today. So I wanna um, move towards that question, how much of this disaster was man-made um, in the rest of my time? Um, in the Philippines, the, the, the National Liberation Movement um, has a sort of slogan talking about land is life, right? And really why they are referring to land as life in this way is that the Philippines, you know, an archipelago of 7,000 islands has super arable soil, right? Um, lots of volcanoes underneath the, the islands making that soil really rich. There's also huge natural and mineral resources in the Philippines. It's second in gold production worldwide, third in copper production. However, um, there's been a tremendous loss of biodiversity on the land and waters, reducing um, sort of the sustainability and livelihood of marine and sort of um, land cultures, right? Deforestation, um, actually the, the top sort of ecological um, problem in the Philippines right now, really has been wrought since the 1960s and even before then I could even argue you know through Spanish colonization but really around the turn to neoliberalism um, for the Philippines foreign corporate firms and really big Philippine land owning um, partners that happen to be um, Philippine politicians have really expanded um, the ability of foreign corporations to come in and um, do a lot of mining. For example, the 1995, the Mining Act of 1995 um, allowed, it was a, a, a policy that instead of just tolerating sort of foreign ownership and fo um, foreign mining interests in the Philippines actually um, promoted sort of foreign and, and large scale mining in the, in, for quote unquote economic growth and um, the alleviation of rural poverty in some of the Philippines, um, some of the islands in the Philippines. Extrata, um, a, a recent sort of um, example, Extrata, a, a corporation that's mining in, the, in South Cotabato, which is a, an area in sort of the central um, and southern Philippines are trying to mine for gold and, and copper deposits and um, with that mining means displacement, actually. And so some, some things that you were saying might totally resonate with these examples. The Balaan tribe um, has been forced to clear their land because of this kind of large-scale mining. And in actuality, um, this sort of US, Philippine, and you know, as you were saying earlier, David, that you know, the multinational corporation as king now, um, the sort of collaborative um, imperialist sort of interest that's happening in the Philippines also causes lots of human rights violations. Um, indigenous people from the Balaan tribe were organizing around stopping these large scale mining and you know, Juvi and Dagil Capion, um, their two sons and five year old daughter were massacred because they were leading a Lumad. Uh, Lumad is the indigenous people of, the, of that area. They were leading an uh, organizing strikes against um, the mining corporation and they were massacred um, because of their, the disruptions, the direct actions that they were trying to take against this mining um, corporation. I'm, I'm stating these sort of um, examples because I would really like to highlight that the breadth and the intensity of the destruction wrought by um, flooding and natural disasters is actually not just about um, climate, right? I, well, it is, okay, I just wanna say that it is. It is about climate, but it's also about um, the policies that support the disempowerment, dispossession of people and their right to life, right? Their right to, their right to their land. Um, 
I mean, I think that continuously in the central Philippines and in the southern Philippines, the denudation of forests, the destruction of watersheds, the massive stiltation of rivers, really make it such that when flooding happens, right, when, de when you kind of see deforestation happening, you see that when rains come down, there's nothing to absorb that water. And when rivers are stilted, there's nothing to sort of, um, you know, absorb the rainwater that's ha that's coming down on on the land. Um, I, I also, you know, I'm a recent um, transplant to Portland, and I know that Oregon is a timber is a timber industry um, sort of state. Correct? Yes. Can I get some head nods? Yes. Okay. One time we were we um, my husband and I were driving to the Oregon coast and saw just like uh, massive cutting down of trees, right? And it made me think of the Philippines and what would happen if a typhoon would strike, you know, uh, heavy rains would strike down here and imagining what that meant um, for people who didn't have time to evacuate their, their villages, their homes, right? I also want to point to um, government accountability in the Philippines. Um, the Philippines um, government under the president, Noynoy Aquino, right now, has been exposed for a pork barrel scandals, this basic um, mismanagement and misappropriation of public funds. They, as you may have heard, were slow to respond to relief and rehabilitation in the Philippines. And much of this um, is, you know, linking it to the TPPA, I think Philippine, the Philippines sort of um, wanting to be part of the TPPA and wanting to be um, a player in the global economy is really about um, just abandoning responsibilities to the public interest and, and sort of trying to get, um, you know, this sort of get rich quick schemes, right, around the TPPA, the free trade agreements. And I want to link this because I think um, that the Philippines continues to be sort of the next growing um, semi-industrial economy in the Philippines, but on the global stage, it looks nice and pretty, right? But in on the ground, the view from the ground is not so pretty, right? Um, the, there was no da disaster prevention program. There, um, in 2012, the budget for that actually even came down a little, uh, or low, lowered because um, of, a keynote sort of um, shift to more public-private partnerships and sort of going towards um, free trade agreements and pursuing a sort of neoliberal agenda. And this is heavily influenced by um, the U.S. and Philippines, the neo-colonial relationship that is um, sort of uh, is driving Philippine politics to this day. Um, the Philippine government and in under sort of um, what Senator or the uh, Hillary Clinton calls America's Pacific Century. The Philippines is a key player here. And not only is it because of the natural resources of the Philippines, but because geopolitically it's a strategic country to be um, occupying, right? And um, the Philippine government um, is sort of taking lead from the US. They're definitely, um, they're definitely wanting the TPPA to come in. But what I would like to say is that the TPPA will only worsen the current conditions of the Filipino people to this day. If there's nothing else you can remember from this rant, right, <laughs> is that, um, that the TPPA will, will um, really trouble national sovereignty for the Philippines, and it will produce really horrendous and continuing her, um, <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Greg Pallison. I'm the Vice President and Political Director of the Association of Western Pulp and Paper Workers Union. And we represent people mostly in force related jobs um, in, in the paper industry. So I'm curious today, how many people here have used paper products, let's say in the last seven days? Can I see a show? Okay, um, maybe in the last 24 hours. Well, let's, let's try to narrow this down. How many have not used paper products in the last 24 hours? And as you said, Oregon and, and the Pacific Northwest is known as, um, you know, forest-related. And we all know, including myself, how controversial logging and uh, the issues related to forestry are. And 
should be, because this country has developed some of the best, uh, most stringent logging practices in the world. And yet, trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, wipe those out as we go on. So I want to use the paper industry as, a, as an example of what has happened, not just to the paper industry, but throughout um, manufacturing in the United States. More lumber mills and sawmills than we've ever had in the last 75 years. And yet, demand for certain products um, within those is it, as high as it is, as, or as high as it's ever been. And m many of the products, of course, now are imports and come in on, um, from other countries. The biggest reason for this is multinational corporations. There are hardly any small or medium-sized pulp or paper operations um, or, or logging operations in the United States. It's multinational corporations that are really you know, kind of scamming the system, and I'll give you a couple examples of that. So Oregon's known as a great recycled city, right, um, which is fantastic. Recovered waste paper um, is, is a big, one of the big issues or big things that are, that are uh, recycled. The Blue Heron Paper Mill in Oregon City closed in 2011. It was a 100% recovered waste paper mill. And yes, it's an ugly facility. Most all manufacturing facilities are not pretty. But yet, they retooled over the years to produce paper products that were in high demand using 100% recovered waste paper. They filed bankruptcy in 2011, went out of business, um, even though they had orders for the next year. One of the main reasons that there's you know, a number of reasons that play into it, but one of the main reasons they filed bankruptcy was they could not afford to continue to purchase recovered waste paper. Even though there was enough supply in the Pacific Northwest, especially Portland area, to do that. So the reason they could not continue to purchase recovered waste paper is recovered waste paper is a commodity. And for the most part, China sets the price of what you pay. And China has uh, tremendous illegal subsidies, um, that they're able to continue to do, even though these trade agreements that are supposed to prevent these subsidies from happening, um, they happen, and in part, because the multinational corporations, Georgia Pacific, International Paper, Warehouser, and the list goes on, um, are the ones that are investing overseas and investing in China. And so there's not an interest to pursue enforcement of the trade agreements that are there, of the language that is, and the ones that are there that should protect us. I find it a little hard to believe that 70% of recovered waste paper in the United States is exported. 70%. That's, that's, you know, so what we're really doing in many ways is we're making the environment worse. So we have politicians that will um, pass and push for strong environmental laws here and labor laws and, and laws that protect us. The MTB um, example is, is a prime one. And so politicians will push for these strong, you know, um, laws here, and yet they'll say, here, go to China, or go somewhere else, or go to, go to, you know, anywhere, South America, and you don't have to abide by those. And many of these trade agreements simply have an environmental clause that says, as a, as a country, you have to have environmental regulations. They, they don't play even on what's there. On the, uh, on the mills that have closed, and I, I could go through a, a list, and I'll, I'll give you some examples. Um, Warehouser in North Bend years ago closed. That equipment is now in Taiwan, producing the same products that we made here. Boise St. Helens, Oregon, had a, paper, a pulp mill. The pulp mill's closed, that equipment's been dismantled, sent overseas, um, producing the same products we have here. International Paper in Albany was, again, this international paper, that was a profitable mill. We know that we represent the workers there, and we had profit sharing. They closed that mill, and another one in, uh, in the south, um, and that equipment, again, was dismantled and shipped overseas. I worked for Warehouser in Longview, Washington. Um, two huge multi-million dollar paper machines that were there were closed, one in 2001 and one in 2004. And every time these closures happen, most of the, the companies mostly have the same announcement, um, low demand for the product, and that these, these um, mills, the equipment, cannot compete on the world market. That's propaganda. The mill I worked at had gone through a $30 million retool rebuild about a year and a half before they close it. And they work the tax breaks in the systems through the trade agreements and through the U.S. to be able to do this. And as we speak today, the two multi-million dollar paper machines that Warehouser claimed could not compete on the world market are producing the very same products they made here, but they're in China. And 
give you another example on the on the tax system and what happens, and then the impact on on jobs in the in the area. Um, a few years ago, there was what's called black liquor tax, and I won't go through it. It's fairly complex, but mills burn what's called biomass and and black liquor to produce um, energy to to man for the manufacturing system, and a combination of 2009. In 2010, International Paper alone received a little over $3 billion in tax credits because they were burning what's considered biomass, black liquor, they'd add biodiesel to it. It was unintended tax break, but they worked the system. So, and, and understand this is just one company, International Paper, Warehouser, Georgia Pacific, all of them did this. So in two year time period, they had over $3 billion in tax breaks, claiming they needed that to keep the U.S. industry afloat, claiming they needed the, you know, in order to keep jobs here. At the same time, they did a $4 billion investment in Indonesia, $2 billion investment in Russia, bought 15 mills in China, and have expanded elsewhere. So, you know, they, they work the system. They, they say that in order to compete, they need um, these tax breaks and different things in the, in the trade agreements, and it really, it's, it's a scam job, and as I said, that not only do the jobs leave, but the equipment and manufacturing facilities themselves are completely dismantled and, and moved overseas. So, uh, end with this. Um, you hear a lot about the national deficit, right? How many of you hear much about the trade deficit? Yeah. And so, I'm going to use the states and the counties as an example. Forget about the national deficit for a minute. Most of the states in our country are broke. Many of the counties are broke, especially rural counties and rural areas. So as have the state governments and the rural and, and county governments grown so huge that they've consumed our tax dollars? The answer is clearly no. So why have they lost the tax base, the tax dollars, to support education um, you know, and, and everything they need? It's because of two main reasons. Tax breaks to the rich, and we've lost our tax base because we've, we've lost our jobs of offshoring. And um, that's, that's the, the loss of jobs in the tax base is one of the main reasons we have a, a national deficit, along with two wars, and I won't get into that part. But, you know, so it's, it's really detrimental on um, rural communities especially. And as I said, you know, as controversial as most all manufacturing is, the, the United States has the most stringent laws in the world, and we ought to encourage manufacturing here and do things. We do it the best, the cleanest, the most responsible way there is, and, and continue these jobs. China now produces more paper products than anybody in the world. And believe it or not, China is worried about India because there's been this shift of manufacturing. It went to Canada, then it went to Mexico, then it's gone to the Asian countries, and now it's going to India. Cheap labor, hardly any environmental laws, hardly any labor laws. And these trade agreements allow for that to happen. And as I said, with our politicians, I mean, I, you know, to me, there's such hypocrites, so many of them, that will push for strong laws here and then sign trade agreements that absolutely wipe those out. And so you're creating, you know, all this damage, and especially, as you said, on, on the environmental side, it's, it's shameful. So, thank you. I'm Elizabeth Swagger. Um, first off, I want to thank our uh, other panelists um, and for Reverend uh, Santos Lyons, Lyons for illustrating why it's so important that we act right now to stop what David called the corporate coup, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, I'm going to be really brief because I know you got a lot of information thrown at you. Uh, and I also want to give an opportunity for you to speak and to share your ideas and uh, plan for some next steps in our breakouts. Um, this forum really could not be more timely because as we speak, there, there are TPP negotiators meeting in Singapore um, to hash out the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, the U.S. Trade Representative is really pushing hard uh, to complete a deal, regardless of how it's going to impact, um, how it's going to devastate, actually, workers across borders, um, you know, making it easier for corporations to shift jobs to wherever labor is cheapest or environmental regulations are the weakest. Um, or uh, the devastating impact it'll have on environmental policies that we need now to uh, combat 
uh, climate change, so that we can prevent the next mega typhoon, uh, so that um, we don't see another devastation as we did in the Philippines. Um, or the attacks on our democracy, uh, taking um, the power to influence uh, public policies to protect public health or safety, or um, in the Philippines, the right to protect their land. Um, and they're taking it away from people and the communities and putting it directly into the hands of corporations. Um, when asked why the TPP um, was so secret, why uh, people could not um, see what's being negotiated in our names, the U.S. Trade Representative said that if people knew what was in it, it could never be passed. So while the U.S. Trade Representative is hell-bent on um, being able to announce a final deal at this these negotiations in Singapore, it's very unlikely that uh, they can finish it in such short time. However, it's very clear that they are gonna be bullying countries to make huge concessions. And the US negotiators have already backed away from their very weak environmental uh, regulations. So you know, th this is clearly going to be a step in the wrong direction. Um, you know, they're expecting to do a frame, framework announcement, um, which will be a bravado announcement saying that uh, they all agree. Um, we're not there yet, um, but you know, we're getting close. For those of you who have been in uh, the TPP fight for some time, you know that Fast Track is the linchpin in defeating the TPP. Um, Fast Track's federal legislation that uh, limits congressional authority over um, trade policy making. And it does that by um, eliminating the regular debate and amendment procedures. So if we stop fast track, um, it'll virtually be impossible for the TPP to be approved. On the flip side, if fast track is granted, uh, then it's gonna be really difficult for us to stop the TPP. Um, because of the amazing work done by many, many of you in the room here, uh, we've had a lot of success. We uh, were able to get every one of Oregon's House Democrats to sign on to a letter opposing Fast Track. Um, and, you know, that was, they were opposing Fast Track legislation from 2002. It expired uh, in 2007. <laughs> Um, you know, and if we can keep it dead, then we have a really good chance of stopping the TPP. Uh, across the country, 151 uh, Democrats uh, opposed fast track and 70, or, I'm sorry, uh, 27 Republicans also signed on to letters. Now that is a strong show uh, of opposition. Um, so it'd be very difficult to get fast track through. Um, unfortunately, our opposition are not uh, taking the hint, instead they're mobilizing. So we are gonna have to do the same and we're going to have to fight back hard. Um, but the work that we've done is really proof of the power of collective organizing. Um, and I wanna remind everyone that we have huge victories in the trade justice movement under our belt. Um, when we uh, organize between environmental uh, groups, between labor, between human rights organizations, back in 1999 in Seattle, we shut down the World Trade Organization. <coughs> That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. And then uh, when we organized across borders, um, we shut down the free trade area of the Americas, and I have no doubt that if we work together, we can stop the Trans-Pacific Partnership, too. Thank you. Wherever you are, call your U.S. Representative and your two U.S. Senators with this simple message. We want to know what's being done in our name. Therefore, release the text now. And two, don't grant President Obama fast-track authority. Fast-track authority requires Congress to give up its constitutional responsibility to oversee trade relations between the U.S. and foreign nations. 
It's designed to slide this agreement through Congress with minimal review and debate. So please call today.